that I want to read to you by John Stott. It says, The excruciating pain of the cross could not silence Jesus' repeated entreaties. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. The soldiers gambled for his clothes. Some woman stood far off. The crowd remained a while to watch. Jesus commended his mother to John's care and John to hers. He spoke words of kingly assurance to the penitent criminal crucified at his side. Meanwhile, the ruler sneered at him, shouting, he saved others, but he can't save himself. Their words, spoken as an insult, were the literal truth. He could not save himself and others simultaneously. He chose to sacrifice himself in order to save the world. And how deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure that He should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure how great the pain of searing loss the father turns his face away has wounds which mother chosen one Bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon the cross, my sin upon his shoulders, a shame. I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. that it is finished yes it is finished oh it is finished oh I will not boast in anything No gifts, no power, no wisdom But I will boast in Jesus Christ His death and resurrection Why should I gain from have paid my ransom. 
5, 6 through 10. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, while we were still God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Mix. 
going to do a responsive reading together tonight as we continue in worship. We're going to read from Isaiah 53, verses 1 through 10. And what's going to happen is I will read a verse, and then you guys will read the next verse together. And so I'm going to read 1, 3, 5, 7, and 9. And you guys are going to read 2, 4, 6, 8, and 10. You guys are already on it. I, you're going to do good at this, I know. Let's listen to this scripture together as we read. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He was despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. That's the beauty of the story of the cross, is that it just doesn't make sense to our minds. That he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. I'm going to sing a song for you that's a, a very new song. It's got an interesting title. It's called The Beautiful Scandalous Night. And it talks about the strangeness of the story. How Christ gave us peace. Christ gave us salvation, and we gave him our sin. I want you to listen to these words tonight. Go on up to the mountain of mercy, to the crimson perpetual tide. Kneel down on the shore, be thirsty no more. Go under and be purified. Follow Christ to the holy mountain. Sinner sorry and wrecked by the fall. Cleanse your heart and soul in the fountain that flows for you, for me, and for all. At the wonderful, tragic, mysterious dream On that beautiful, scandalous night you and me We're atoned by His blood and forever washed white On a beautiful, scandalous night On the hillside you will be delivered At the foot of the 
cross justified and your spirit restored by the river that pours from my blessed Savior's side at the wonderful tragic mysterious tree on that beautiful scandalous night you and me we're atoned by his blood and forever washed away night at the wonderful tragic mysterious dream on that beautiful scandalous night you and me we're its own by his blood and forever washed away on a beautiful scandalous night mountain of mercy to the crimson perpetual tide kneel down on the shore be thirsty no more go under and be purified at the wonderful tragic mysterious tree on that beautiful scandalous night you and me we're atoned by his blood and forever washed away on a beautiful scandalous night on a beautiful scandalous night on a beautiful scandalous night father we're thankful for that night Father, that when you said it is finished, God, when you bore our sins, when you were, you were crushed for us, when you were pierced for us, when our chastisement was on you. Father, may tonight as we reflect on your sufferings, may we understand truly what amazing grace looks like that you, the, the perfect, blameless, spotless lamb, paid the price for us. Father, as we hear from your word and as we understand what the sacrifice means, would you speak to our hearts? God, as we contemplate your suffering and your sacrifice, may it weigh on our hearts tonight because we know, Father, that Friday is dark, but Sunday's coming. Father, you're good and you're kind. Father, may we behold your goodness in this place tonight. In your name we pray, amen. In Luke chapter six, we read Luke's account of the Beatitudes. And Jesus is teaching what it looks like to live in a world in submission to the kingdom of God. So he talks to the people gathered there. And describes what it is, what it's like to be good to those who do evil to you. To lend, expecting nothing in return. And what it is to suffer. And he speaks of God being a God who is good to the evil. And a God who gives, expecting nothing in return. And then in Luke 6, in verse 35, we read these words about God. And he says that he is kind 
to the ungrateful and to the evil. Jesus demonstrates what it is to be the kindness of God to those whom he created who are largely ungrateful. And all of us, the Bible tells us, are set apart from God on the basis of our sin. And the Bible refers to that as being evil. And as we look at this here, this tree, the makings of a cross, what we see is an instrument of brutality, of evil, meant to hold the Son of God, meant to receive his life. Jesus, <laughs> Palm Sunday, as he came into town, he was honored. He was praised and adored. He was worshiped. Everybody so excited to praise the name of Jesus. Hosanna. Hosanna to God in the highest, laying their coats before him, palm fronds before him. Jesus, knowing what he was going to do, knowing that some of those before him would also cry out, crucify. Jesus, kind to the ungrateful. Jesus, kind to the evil. The next day after he comes into the town, he goes into the temple. And he goes in and, and he sees that his father's house has been made into the habitude, the, the house, a place that is nothing more than a den of robbers. The church has been made into a spectacle. The worship of God has been exchanged for the exchanging of funds. Capitalism come first century. So he turns the tables over. We see the goodness of our God in a strange kind of kindness as he's kind to those who are ungrateful, as he's kind to those who are evil. You know, it's interesting. What makes the Pharisees most angry it's when the children praise him. And they chastise Jesus for failing to rebuke children for giving him what he is due. Because Jesus, he's kind to the ungrateful. He is kind to the evil. Jesus with the disciples. John chapter 13 gives us this beautiful picture. <laughs> He's gathered in there and they're, they're celebrating the Passover together. Now in this room where he's gathered together, he knows that there's one in this group, Peter, who's gonna deny him. And there's another in this group, Judas, who's gonna betray him. So Jesus is in there and he has a towel wrapped around his waist the disciples come in and their feet are dirty. They've been walking the streets of Jerusalem, their feet are dirty, and what does Jesus do? Jesus is there on his knees, a towel in a bowl, and he prepares to wash their feet. He's washing the feet of a denier and a betrayer because we know that Jesus 
Jesus is kind to the ungrateful. Jesus is kind to the evil. there with the disciples he, he tells Peter what it's going to be like for Peter to betray him and Peter's a lot like a lot of us I'll never do that that'll, I mean, that'll never be me surely you're talking about John or, or maybe Luke or, or where's that schmuck Matthew I bet it's him <laughs> but not me Peter wouldn't find forgiveness until he was on the far side of his rebellion. But what did Jesus give him? You see, Jesus is kind to the ungrateful. He's kind to the evil. So even as he's at the table with Peter, he's at the table with Judas, he does not withhold his goodness from them. He does not withhold the invitation for them to experience the love of God. Because Jesus being very God of very God, he's kind to the ungrateful. He's kind to the evil. From this upper room, Judas has had enough. He decides it's worth it. So for 30 pieces of silver, this ungrateful, evil man who has received nothing but the kindness of God at the hands of Jesus betrays the Lord of all heaven. The other disciples gather with Jesus in a place called the Garden of Gethsemane and Jesus asks them as he goes along to pray if they'll stay and if they will stay awake and they'll stay vigilant if they'll pray with him and for him. The disciples can't stay awake. They're exhausted. It's time and again he comes over and he rouses them, he wakes them up because Jesus is kind to the ungrateful. In the distance, they see the crowds coming near. Judas bringing a band of soldiers, really rabble with torches and clubs. Judas draws near to Jesus. He leans in into Jesus' cheek. He kisses him. The Son of God receives the evil of his betrayer on his face. And he looks him square in the eye because Jesus is kind to the ungrateful. And in the case of Judas, he's kind to the evil. So Jesus is beaten, tied, and drugged before the high priest. He goes before Caiaphas. He goes to his house in the middle of the night. They have a makeshift trial. It is such a farce. He taught daily in front of everybody, but now here as they seek to do works of evil, they take him in the middle of the night. They run him through anything but justice. And they find him guilty of being who he is. Knowing that they don't have the right to do anything to him on their own, they say, oh, we need to take him to Pilate. Pilate can put an end to this man for us. Jesus, all-powerful, able to call down the full host of heaven at a moment's notice, the snap of his finger, accepts their violence against him because he's kind to the ungrateful. and He's kind even to those who design evil for him. So 
so they take him to Pilate. Now, Pilate is a little bit of a shrewd operator. His job is really essentially to keep the peace, not to please the Jews, but just to kind of control them a little bit. So as Pilate meets with Jesus, it's a little bit troubling because he's having a hard time putting his finger exactly what Jesus has done wrong other than he's made the wrong people angry. So Pilate's meeting with him and questioning him and presuming to have unbelievable power control over him, all the while Jesus knows Pilate has none. Pilate, looking to steer his way out of it, says, oh, this guy's from Galilee. He needs to go see Herod because Herod is in charge of Galilee. Now, the funny thing about this is Herod and Pilate, they weren't friends. They, in a word, despised one another. They hated each other. So Jesus goes over to Herod. Herod can't get anything out of him. So he has him dressed in purple. They mock him. They abuse him. They spit on him. They ridicule him. The high king of heaven suffering with abuse at the hand of those he created. And Jesus? Hmm. See, Jesus is kind to the ungrateful and kind to the evil. So he's sent back to Pilate. Pilate thinks, I'll work my way out of this. I'll give you your choice. You can have a murderous wretch in Barabbas or you can have this guy who really just seems to say the wrong kinds of things. They cry out for a murderer instead of Jesus. They, they cry out for, for one guilty of heinous crimes. They cry out for one that they wouldn't want to be anywhere near. You see, they cry out for anyone and everyone other than the Son of God. And what does Jesus do? He maintains silence. He maintains calm. But most of all, he stays as one, kind to the ungrateful. And he stays as one, kind to the evil. Because that's who Jesus is. So Pilate has Jesus taken, and the Bible uses the word scourged. So they have Jesus taken out. He has his hand suspended above a post. And they take a cat of nine tails, a leather whip with its ends woven with bits of sheep bone and lead balls. And again and again they whip him, tearing his flesh from his body, tearing into muscle, removing flesh from his side. This is why Isaiah says and is able to just say that he looks like one stricken, smitten, afflicted from God or by God, one from whom men shield their faces. That's what it looked like. Jesus abused, beaten. Hebrews tells us that he's the one that spoke the world into creation. He controlled the elements. He walked on the water. And here in this moment, he is beaten, crushed, destroyed. Many times as people would experience scourging, they'd pass out and so 
the lictor, the person administering the scourging, would take a bucket of salt water and throw it on their open sores to revive them, to keep them in the moment of their pain. So Jesus is taken there, and then the soldiers take a crown of thorns and they shove it down upon his head and they send him out to be crucified. The Bible tells us that a man named Simon of Serene helped carry Jesus, helped carry Jesus' cross. Jesus who'd been beaten. Jesus who'd been abused. But Jesus who throughout maintained kindness to the ungrateful. Kindness to the evil. So they get Jesus up the hill The Bible tells us that Jesus would hang on the cross for six hours. Six hours. Six hours of agony. Six hours of pain. Six hours of kindness. Of kindness to the ungrateful. You see, as Jesus was there, they took his arms and they stretched his arms out. Now, the Bible says it's his hands, but what we know from history is that they would stretch their arm out and they would drive a spike between the two small bones of the forearm. Tearing through muscle, flesh, crushing bone. They weren't very good with a hammer. Then they'd go down and they would take their feet. They would overlap their feet and they would drive it through to hold them in place. in order to get relief. Prisoner would push up on their feet through the nail, through the anguish, just to be able to draw a breath. It's Jesus upon the cross. Jesus hanging on the cross. With a thief to his left and a thief to his right, being mocked, being ridiculed, bleeding, struggling for breath. There's a moment where Jesus takes on the penalty and the punishment for your sin and mine. His prayer, his prayer before God, quoting Psalm 22, is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus, as he hears the jeers, the shouts, the ridicule, the hatred, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. You said you could tear the temple down and rebuild it in in three days. Call all heaven to defend you. Jesus, to the voice of the ungrateful, has this prayer. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. For six hours, 
He hung in anguish, in torment, struggling for breath, bleeding from his back, his hands, his feet, his brow. Until finally his word to the Father is, I, I submit my spirit to you. And Jesus would breathe his last and he would die. And this is Good Friday. And this is the Jesus who is kind to the ungrateful and kind to the evil. This is our king, dead. Let us pray. God, you are indeed kind to the ungrateful and the evil. We see the evil of man displayed in the crucifixion of the Son of God. We see the lack of graciousness, of kindness, of thanks in the lives of so many and, in, and sometimes in our own. This Friday is good not because we esteemed him, not because he received our goodness, but because he endured your wrath for us. So God, I pray that we would have a sense of sorrow at the sacrifice of Christ and a longing for the joy because today is Friday. The Sunday is coming. Amen. God, we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Hey, listen, we want to thank you for coming tonight. If you're here and you don't know the rest of this story, don't wait two days to hear it on Easter Sunday. Man, catch myself, one of the other staff, we'd love to share with you of where it goes from the horrors of the cross to what's waiting on Sunday. Because Sunday's coming, amen? Amen. 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 We'll see you Sunday. Have a good night.